Hi everyone. Let's take a moment to talk about taps. All taps are not created equal. First of all, the kind of taps that you can go out and get in the hardware store are not that great. They're generally carbon steel taps. They may not even be sharp. I recommend actually ordering them from an industrial supplier and uh, getting high-speed steel taps. But even then you've got some options. Now most taps that we might be familiar with are what are called hand taps. So you can see the flutes that are ground in this are just straight and what happens is when you're turning these they cause a chip to be cut and it curls up and uh, keeps curling up in that flute. And that's why you have to occasionally turn back to break that chip off before you can keep turning. Now they've got some taps that you can use under power which is what I'm going to be showing you in this video. The first kind is the spiral point tap. So you can see on here there's this angled cut at the end of the flute. And it basically coincides with uh, the, the first uh, few threads there that actually do the cutting. What happens with this is when you're cutting because of the angle, it, uh, the chip that's formed is pushed forward in front of the tap. So these are great for through holes. You can use them for blind holes as well, but you just need to make sure that there's room at the bottom of the hole for the chips to collect. Now they've got the spiral flute tap as well. And you can see this one looks similar to a drill bit and it acts the same way as far as the chip is concerned. Uh, as you're turning this, the chip is actually pulled out. Now with both of these, it's not necessary at all to turn back to break the chip. Since the chip is being pushed away, uh, it's not going to collect in the flutes, and you won't have a problem with tap breakage because of that. The last one on here, and this is going to be tough to see, this is what's called a thread forming tap. So there are no flutes that you can see, but if you were to have one of these in your hands and you put them between your fingers and turned it, you can feel there's actually several lobes on it. It uh, feels like there's two on this one, and it just depends on how big it is. This is a pretty small tap. This is a, uh, a 440. So what a thread forming tap does is it actually displaces metal. The analogy I like to use is if you were playing with Play-Doh and you put Play-Doh in your fingers and you squeezed it, yes, you'd be making indentations with your fingers, but you'd also have Play-Doh squeezing out between your fingers. So for that reason, you actually need to use a larger tap drill size when you're using a thread forming tap. Uh, otherwise, that material gets squished into the root of the, th the thread and you end up jamming up the tap and you can break it. Now there's also tip styles to worry about. This first one, and hopefully you can see it in the camera here, um, you can see how much of a taper there is at the front. And this type of tap is actually called a taper tap. This one doesn't actually reach the full thread diameter until right there by my fingernail. Um, a good five-eighths of an inch or three-quarters of an inch from the end of the tap. So these take the least amount of torque to cut. They're generally good for through holes and you can use them uh, to start a hole especially in harder materials because it doesn't take as much torque to cut so you're less likely to break the tap. Now the most common one you're going to come across is called a plug tap and that's this guy. The full diameter of the threads ends up right about right there. And um, on the taper tap, it was about 10 threads before it got to the full diameter. This one's about 5. So again, good for through holes. It doesn't take too much torque to cut. Again, you can't really get very close to the bottom of a blind hole. Uh, right now, about 3 eighths of an inch for this size. So this style is what's called a bottoming tap. And there's actually only two threads, maybe two and a half, before it actually gets to the full diameter of the thread. So that would be right about there. And you can get within an eighth or three sixteenths of the bottom of a blind hole. So generally when I do use bottoming taps, uh, I start out with a plug tap first, because that's the one I have most of. Um, and then I'll go as far as I can with the plug tap and then I'll finish off the hole with the bottoming tap just to get those last few threads if it's something that I, I desperately need. So let's get to tapping some holes. Uh, now just for prep work I've already gone through 
and I've drilled my my tap drill holes as well as put a chamfer on the edge of those holes. Chamfering is something that is necessary if you're going to tap a hole every single time. Without a chamfer what happens is the first thread comes along and peels up this large burr uh, that is very difficult to remove after the fact. So chamfering really alleviates that and makes it a lot easier to clean up after the fact. Now you could do this with a countersink or what I did is used a 90 degree spot drill and I'll try to get this in focus here. I've shown off spot drills in my other video on uh, consistent countersink depths and spot drills. This is a short stubby drill. It does not actually have clearance ground on the sides uh, so it's not really meant for grind, uh, drilling a hole. It's meant for just putting the little kiss there uh, for the larger drill to follow. So what I like to do with these is uh, I'll put them in there and I'll go ahead and drill deep enough to where I not only spot the hole but I also countersink it. That gives me my chamfer and I can just go straight to the tap after I drill. It's also a really good idea when you're tapping to use a keyed chuck rather than a keyless one. Keyless chucks self-tighten, which means that under the torque of cutting that thread, they're going to really be tightening quite a lot, which uh, generally isn't a problem, but they're also self-loosening. So a lot of times when you throw the mill or the lathe into reverse, it ends up leaving the tap behind in the part. So I like to use keyed chucks. All right, um, I've got the mill set at its lowest speed, which in my case is 80 RPM. And I'm gonna zoom in so you can see the holes a little bit better. So these are through holes, they, meaning they go all the way through the part. If this was a blind hole, you would be able to do this under power. You would just have to stop shortly after the, the tap grabs and I usually finish it up by hand in those cases. I'm going to show you a blind hole when I show you how to do this on the lathe. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, I've got the mill geared down as low as it'll go, which is 80 RPM. And I'm going to put a little bit of oil on here. What's going to happen is I'm going to pull this down and as soon as it grabs it's actually going to just feed by itself because of the thread on the tap. So once we're all the way through, you can see it's slipping a little bit there. Once we're all the way through, I'll just throw the mill into reverse and it feeds back out. Now what I'm doing is putting a little bit of upward pressure on the quill handle so that it won't drag at the top of a hole. So you can see I've got a pretty nice thread in there. I'm going to go ahead and blow off the tap and tap the other hole. Okay, so I'm going to tap the second hole and I adjusted the angle of the camera so you can see it when it breaks through at the bottom. I'll put a little bit more oil on it and we're ready to go. So you can see I just let it go through a, a fair amount uh, just to make sure that I was clearing the, the whole piece and that I got the full thread depth all the way down. And then I just flipped it into reverse and fed back out. So now I've got two nice clean holes uh, with 5 16 24 threads in this case. Next stop is over to the lathe. So this is going to be a blind hole in the lathe using a spiral flute tap. So you're going to see, in this case there's three flutes, so you're going to see three chips being pulled out by each of the flutes. Now when you're power tapping in the lathe, you actually want to use your tailstock, and it's held in the drill chuck pretty securely, and I'm leaving the tailstock loose so that it can slide back and forth. It's a good idea to crank it out a little ways before you start. That way your tailstock doesn't get pulled into the carriage and suddenly stop, which would break your tap. I've got the lathe set at its slowest RPM, which is 50 RPM here. I'm going to put a little oil on that. 
since this is a blind hole, what I'm going to do is run it in a little ways and then stop the machine and finish it up by hand. So let's go ahead and get started. So you could see the tap slipping in the drill chuck there, and that's pretty common when you're tapping under power, whether the mill or the lathe. What you're doing is exceeding the holding capacity of the drill chuck, which means that it's slipping, and you're, that means your tap's not going to break. So uh, generally, I, I don't tighten it up as much as I possibly can, because I don't want it to suddenly grab and snap. So let me go ahead and take the drill chuck off, and then we will finish this up by hand. So here you can see my three chips that got formed and they're getting pulled out of the hole by the tap. And I'm just going to finish this up by hand and just go until I reach the bottom of the hole. Normally you would run this in and then when you were through the hole you would just turn the lathe on in reverse and you would feed back out. Uh, but since this is a blind hole I didn't want to run it all the way in and bottom it out and potentially snap the tap. And there we go. I've got the same 5 24 spiral point tap that I had at the mill and I've already drilled and chamfered my hole. Again, notice the chamfer. I'm going to say it again. You always want to chamfer at the beginning of your thread, whether it's internal or external, whether you're tapping or using a die or single point threading it. The chamfer will keep you from getting a burr at the beginning of the thread, which is usually quite difficult to remove. I'm going to move the tailstock forward until it grabs and feeds itself in a few threads until it's stable and then I'll finish it up by hand. You really, really don't want to jam a tap down into the bottom of a blind hole. So just like before, I'm going to put a little bit of cutting oil on the tap and let's go ahead and turn it off. If this was a through hole or even as a blind hole, you could uh, turn the lathe on in reverse and pull it back out. But I'll just go ahead and finish this up by hand and there's no point in taking the tap out to do that. So that's the end of my hole. And I'll go ahead and pull this out. So one more thing about taps. You'll notice in the video that I ran both machines as slow as they would go. And the reason for that is because when the tap grabs, you're self-feeding by the pitch of the thread. Think of it this way. This is a 3 8 16 tap, and so that means that each thread is a sixteenth of an inch apart, which means that when the machine is running, it's feeding down towards your vise or in towards your headstock at a sixteenth of an inch per revolution, which is very uncomfortable. For the metric folks, imagine this was an M6 by 1. Uh, that means that it would be feeding down towards your vise or in towards your headstock at a millimeter per revolution. You can see we're running that at high speeds could get you in trouble very quickly. You would have no reaction time whatsoever if you just turned the machine on and let it grab. It would bury the tap before you could even react. I know some people will start the machine quickly and just let it grab and turn the machine off immediately and that's fine if you're comfortable doing that way to go buddy you could also pulse the power button so it feeds in a little at a time and, and that's fine if you're comfortable with any of those things go ahead and try them there are also people who like to lock their tailstock on the lathe and then feed in with the tap using the crank handle on the tailstock and if you're comfortable with that that's great too I personally don't like to do it because I see it as a recipe for breaking taps. I really don't like to break taps. If you're not cranking in fast enough or out fast enough when you throw the lathe into reverse, you can get jammed up pretty quickly. That could cause you to snap your tap, of course. It could also cause you to strip out the threads you just made, and no one wants that. So the technique I showed where you just leave the tailstock unlocked and let it feed in and then feed back out, it's the pretty much the safest way you can go. Anyway, I hope this helps you understand a bit more about tapping, and especially tapping under power. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.